All right. Well, I think just to uh, pick up where we, uh, some things we were talking about when we were together last time, we, we talked about the basics of object-oriented programming in ABOP and some of its features. We talked about the fact that we define classes and we actually define that in two different pieces. Um, we have a definition of a class and then we have an implementation of a class that exists in two different code blocks. And to this point, all of our uh, code that we have been writing and looking at has been in the context of the class definition, but we will get to the implementation today. We spent a big chunk of our time yesterday um, differentiating between the public and private sections, but then more particularly getting into a discussion of parameter passing. And we talked about the fact that there are three different mechanisms or methods of passing parameters to methods in the ABAP programming language. We can designate a parameter as an importing parameter, which carries with it the idea that we are sending data to a particular method for it to use in its functionality. And then as a part of that, um, the, the method will not change the value of that particular parameter. Um, it will just use it as input. And we talked about the fact that these input parameters can be designated as input, or excuse me, as optional or default. We talked about exporting parameters and how they are always optional by default. Uh, but the idea here is that these are parameters that are set by the method and used to send data back to the caller. And we will use this particular methodology whenever we're sending back multiple uh, pieces of data from a method uh, in particular. And then just at the end of our time, we talked about what would be a combination of the two, which would be designating a parameter as changing. And the idea here is that this is a parameter that gets passed to a method. And so in that respect, it is like an importing parameter, but the method can change it and thereby use it to send data back to the caller. So in that respect, it is like an exporting parameter. And changing parameters can be designated as optional and they can have default values specified as, as well. And so I think that is where we left off in our time together today. We have one more piece to add to the parameter passing uh, puzzle. And technically speaking, this last one is not a parameter, but it works much like a parameter in that it gives us a way of passing data back from a method that we would call. And that is designating a returning value. A method may be defined to return a single value to the caller. And a returning value will always use pass by value. Recall that we said that we could designate a parameter as pass by value in the context of importing, exporting, or changing, but that by default it was pass by reference. Well, in the context of a returning value, it is by default pass by value. And so not only is it by default, but it is um, the only way that we can send things back in this respect. This is specified by listing returning value in the interface. And so I'll show you code uh, related to the syntax of that here in a moment. But the idea is that if we want a method that when it is done sends just one, call, one value back to the caller, we could use this. And the example I gave last time of this would be if we were to define something like a square root function and we would pass it a particular piece of data, the data that we passed it, you know, this would be an importing parameter because we're sending it to the method for it to receive and then it would send us back the result. And so we could have code something like x equals the square root of seven. Well, the mechanism whereby the square root method sends back its answer would be a returning parameter. Now notice with this, if returning is indicated, then we can't use exporting and changing parameters. 
So what I have just put here on the whiteboard would be something that we could do, passing data to a square root function where that data would just be going to the method. Similarly, we could write, let's say, a power function where we would pass it two values and it would raise the first value to the power of the second value. So this would be four to the seventh power. Um, we could do that as well. And that would still be consistent with the idea of sending uh, data to a method in the context of it taking data in, and then it's sending back just one piece of data. So we don't have to have importing parameters, but if we're going to use a returning value, we can't use either exporting or changing. So we've got to be cognizant of that in the code that we write. Unlike a lot of other programming languages, we don't have an explicit return statement. It's uh, very common in other programming languages where in your method, you'll get to the end of the method and you'll have a statement that says return and typically there's a variable there or maybe a calculation and that tells you what value the method is going to return. We don't do it that way. Instead, what we do is, as you'll see here in a moment, in our method interface, we define a variable and then we just set the value of that variable in the method. And when the method reaches the end of its logic, whatever the value of that variable is, is what is actually returned. This kind of method has a particular um, name associated with it. And that is we call this a functional method. And functional methods pick up the ability for us to use them in places where we cannot use other methods. For example, in ABOP, we could do something like if the square root of x is greater than 20. Okay, We, we could write code like that because the idea would be this would call the square root method, the square root method would do the calculation return of value, and so we can combine this in this fashion. We can do this with functional methods. We cannot do things like this with other methods that we would, we would employ. So that's another unique characteristic of this. And then one of the kind of oddities associated with the use of returning is we have particular restrictions on the kind of typing that we can employ here. We cannot use an incomplete data type. So we could not, for example, use a C with the length of whatever specified because that's an incomplete data type. We could use string, though. We could use I, we could use D, or we could define a user-defined data type. But we cannot use incomplete data types in the context of the data type for a returning parameter. So that's kind of a unique element, and to be honest with you, I'm not entirely sure why that restriction exists, but it is something that does occur from time to time that we have to take into account, and we can easily, we can easily resolve by doing our own type definition as necessary. So let's look at what code would look like here. And, this particular slide brings together really all of the things that we have talked about to this point. So I have here in the public section of this example class two methods defined. Method one, which imports two parameters, one called var1, one called var2. Var1 is optional and it's of type i. Var2 is required. It also is of type i, but it's going to be passed by value. So the distinction here is var1, method one is going to operate on the original. It's not going to make a copy. But var2, we are going to make a copy of that because we're going to be employing pass by value. Then this particular method, when it's done, is going to export var3 of type i, and it's actually going to take in another method called var4 type i that it is going to change. Now, I have no idea what this hypothetical method does, but we see the parameter passing associated with it. Now, let me ask you this. This particular method 
appears to be, you know, it's employing an exporting statement and it's only sending back one piece of data. Why could we not just rewrite this and make it a functional method like we were just talking about and employ returning as a way of sending back the data? I'm using changing, okay? So as soon as I, I, for whatever reason, appear to need var4 as a changing type parameter here, and so the fact that that's present is what tells me I can't use a functional method type interface. But method, method two is a functional method. You'll notice it imports a single parameter, var1, which is of type i, having a default value of four, and then it's going to return a parameter called retval, which is also going to be of type i. Now, just as an observation, these are horrible parameter names, okay? This is just for a hypothetical example here, and so as you are writing your own code, you definitely want to employ better, better parameter names than what I am showing you here, but this is more to illustrate the syntax than to focus on that aspect of the example. So uh, let's go back to the code that we have been writing together and let's look for a place where we can introduce a functional method. And let's just real quickly review what we've got going on here. We have a class that has four attributes associated with it. We have a driver, which is actually a structured data type and so for the driver, we have a name, age, gender, and years driving. We have color, we have a number of wheels, and then we have gas, which in this case, the idea is this is storing how much gas um, we actually have available in the tank of this vehicle. Well, let's think about what could be another uh, element that we could add to this, and so maybe um, let's add a couple of, of additional parameters here. Um, let's add gas consumed. And I'm going to have to go back and add a comma here. And we'll say that gas consumed will also be of type P length 2 decimals 1. And so this is going to store uh, the amount of gas that we've consumed thus far. And then we'll add one more here, here, which is miles traveled, which we'll just make that, well, let's be consistent here. I think most speedometers show uh, miles in, in uh, one decimal place, so we'll do type P. But we probably need more than just um, a length of two, so and we probably also need this to be bigger for our gas consumed here. So let's see, how many digits would a typical speedometer have? We would probably have at least, what, eight? Six and a, six and a decimal? Sounds pretty good. So, so if we needed six and a decimal, we could get away with a packed size of four. So let's just use that for both of these here. Uh, type P length four decimals one, okay? And so now I've added this to it. And, and the reason why I just added those things is let's add a new method here. And I'm just gonna add it up to the top here so that it's easier in the screen that we have here. And so I'm going to add a method, methods. And we're gonna call this um, calculate MPG. Okay, and for calculating miles per gallon, we're actually not going to have to pass it any information because what it's going to do is it's going to use the amount of gas we've consumed and it's going to use the number of miles we've traveled and it's just going to give us back uh, by way of returning the miles per gallon for this particular uh, vehicle to this point. So the only thing that I have here is returning returning value, and I need to figure out what I'm gonna call this, and I'll just call this MPG, so that's a new variable here, and then type, and now we see that we run into a problem, because if I try and do uh, type P, 
now I'm using an incomplete data type here. Okay, so rather than take the time to define my own custom data type, which I could, and we know how to do, for right now I'm just going to say that this is going to return miles per gallon as an integer. Okay, not an ideal solution, but, but one that will in fact work for us just fine. All right, so this would now be an example of a functional method. So this would give me the ability in my code, for example, to do something like if miles per gallon is less than 10, write out to the screen gas guzzler or something like that. So I can do a lot of different things now with the calculate MPG method that I could not do, for example, with any of the others that we have written to, to this point. So we've talked about the parameter passing. Well, the piece we have not talked about is writing the guts of the method, writing the actual code that says what the method is, is going to do. And that, oh, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned this, but, or this is a good place to reiterate it. When we list our parameters, we may not have all four of these. And by definition, if we have returning, we can't have exporting and changing. But when we list the parameters, they have to appear in this order. Importing, then exporting, then changing, and then returning. So you'll notice that pattern being followed here in this particular slide. And that's a key element of our parameter passing. All right, so as I was getting ready to say a moment ago, how do we write the guts of the method? Well, the actual logic of the method is written in the method implementation. The method implementation is the code that goes in the class implementation. So what I'm talking about here is if we go back to our code, everything we have written so far is in the class definition. Well, the guts of the method now go down here in the implementation of the class. And all we do is we don't have to list the parameter names. We don't have to list the parameter types because they're up in the definition. So all we list here in the implementation is the name of the method and then it's related code. So if I wanted to define method one, you'll notice the comments here, the code for method one goes here. And if we cross-reference this with the last slide, you'll see that this method had two parameters, var1 and var2, which were defined as importing. And var3 was defined for exporting. And var4 was listed as changing. So I would have code that could use all of those variables. It could create its own local variable just for the sake of method one. But I would just list the word keyword method, singular, and the name of the method, a period, and then the code associated with that particular method, and then the end method statement. And so I would see a sequence here where I have for every method that is defined in my definition section, I would see a corresponding block in the implementation section associated with that. So we now have some code to write because as we have observed before, if I go back here to my SAP GUI and I do a check, the first thing it tells me is you're missing uh, implementation for a method. And to be honest, I don't know why it jumped down to add gas because that's not the first method that I'm missing the definition of, but nonetheless it flagged that as being one that's problematic. So we need to solve this. I don't know if you've noted this particular trick in the SAP GUI. I find it to be particularly helpful when I am doing things related to class definitions. You can actually split the screen. If you didn't see how I did that, right here in the upper right-hand corner, there's this little uh, region there right at the top of the scroll bar that if I drag down, well, I did it a second ago. There we go it will let me split the screen. So, and the top here, um, I have calculate miles per gallon. So let's come down here now to the implementation. And so I would have the keyword method. Now notice when I start typing this, 
the automatic suggestion of keywords is going to try and spot me the keyword methods. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll go ahead and take that and then I'll just hit the backspace key to wipe off that S. Whatever you want to do there is fine as long as you wind up with the word method when all is said and done. And so I have a method here called calculate MPG period. And now I'm going to write the code for this. And the key is that the variable MPG, which is what is designated as returning, is what needs to be set somewhere in this particular method. Well, how am I going to calculate this? Well, what I could do is I could say for calculate method, this would simply be uh, the amount of gas that I've consumed divided by the number of miles that I have traveled is how I'm going to calculate the miles per gallon. But I do have, it's always a good idea to protect against this. I don't want to do this math if for some reason um, miles traveled is zero because then I get division by zero, which is undefined. So I am going to guard this. I'll put if miles traveled is greater than zero, then I'll do this calculation. And I'll put in now an else clause, else. And it's kind of hard to know what I should set MPG to at this point. But otherwise, what I'll do here is I'll just hard code MPG to be equal to zero at this point. That seems like a reasonable thing to do. And then end if. So I have now defined what calculate MPG does. And so the key things to keep in mind is here, my, my interface says that I have to set this variable MPG to a value. And you can clearly see in my code where I have done that. So what's going to happen is when it gets to the end of the method, which by the way, I haven't added that keyword to my code here. So that piece is method, missing. But as soon as I add end method to this, I've now defined that entire method. And so it's not like in, in some languages, as soon as you set a return value, the method ends at that point. That's not what's going to happen here. All of this code is going to be executed. And then when it gets to the end of the control flow, it will send um, control flow back to the caller with the expectation that the returning value will have been set. Any questions about this? All right, so for this to be a fully functioning uh, class, we have some other code that we need to do here. Here's set color, okay? So method set color, and this one is taking in a new color, and it's going to use it to change the value of the parameter color, or excuse me, the, the attribute color. So color equals new color, done. I mean, that one was really straightforward. And so we're simply taking the parameter, which is the new color, and using it to set the color, which is up, scrolled off the top of my screen, which is an attribute. Well, set wheels, let's see what we have here. I think this one's pretty straightforward. The only thing that's different about this one is we do have a default value set. So let's do method set wheels. And this is now going to be, whoops, don't know why my cursor flew up there to the top. Wheels equals new num wheels. And was my, was my attribute just called wheels or was it called num wheels? It's called wheels, okay. So wheels equals new num wheels. And method, okay. And set driver, okay. So this one's gonna be a little bit more uh, code involved here and so, but we're still following the same pattern here. Method 
set driver. And now I have name, age, gender, and years driving. But if we'll notice, my attribute is a structure called driver with name, age, gender, and years driving. So what this is going to look like is uh, driver dash name equals name, driver dash age equals age, driver dash gender equals gender, driver dash years driving equal years driving. Now, there is a subtle, I don't know if we would call this a mistake, but there is a subtle potential problem in the code that I have written. What do you see here that could be problematic? And you do, in fact, have enough information on the screen to see all of the code to answer that question. Yes? Gender is an incomplete type. Gender is an incomplete type, but we're not using in the context of returning, so I'm probably going to be okay, but we'll see in a second if that, in fact, is the case. That's a good observation. What else? Yes, sir? Okay, so if, if age and gender are optional, what if the user elected not to set them and then I do this down here with the equal sign? I, I could be wiping out a perfectly valid age and a perfectly valid gender. You know, maybe this is a situation where what, I, what all the user wants to do, all the caller wants to do is give me a new name for the driver and maybe give me a new number of years driving and, and leave the age and gender where it was. So in my guts of my method, I have to realize the fact that sometimes I have parameters that are optional. Now let's, let's talk about name for a second. Name has a default value. So either name is going to be set to what the user explicitly set it to on the calling side, or this will result in name being set to name unknown. But that's all good. And years driving, I know I'm going to get a value for because it's required. So my years driving is good. But age and gender might not be set to a value at all. So how do I figure out whether they have been set to a value? Well, there are multiple ways that we could do this, but one method that is commonly employed is to use the test, is initial. And let's look at the documentation for is initial real quick to see how we can employ this. And so I'm looking for is initial, which that's funny. It doesn't seem to actually, let's see, we'll just use the word initial in our search of the documentation here. Well, it took me to the same same option here, and I'm not seeing it. That's probably, I don't know if it's an arithmetic expression or not. But at any rate, I'll just show you this. What we can do is we can do this. If age, and there's a couple different ways we could write our code here, but we can do this. If age is not initial, driver age equals age. And then we have to pair that with end if. And then similarly, if gender is not initial, 
then we'll set gender. So the idea here is if the user has set that to a value, then I'm going to execute the conditional code here and use it to change the value of the attribute. But if the user didn't give me an age and didn't give me a gender, then I, I'm, I'm not going to be doing anything with that at all. All right, so let's see if I've got any more methods to take care of. Uh, get driver info. Okay, so now I've got to come down here and method get driver info. And now I'm just, I'm just setting exporting parameters. So I'm going to do name, kind of the inverse of what we did a moment ago. Name equals driver dash name. And age equals driver dash age. And gender equals driver dash gender. And years driving equal driver dash years driving. Now, the idea here, the reason why we used exporting is this gives me a way to send back to the caller four pieces of data, which I cannot do with the returning mechanism. So that's why we had to employ that. All right, so forging right ahead. Now we have, yes, sir. this scenario right here. When I want to particularly structure it, the, the value of a method of this sort, value of a functional method, is I can use it in places I can't use other methods. So the rule of thumb would be whenever I can write a method that way, it's good to write it that way. So in fact, you kind of want to flip your scenario the inverse, which is if I can write it as a functional method, write it this way, but if I can't, write it using one of the other ways. Okay. And it's just strictly because it opens up more options for us. But you're right. If any of the things that disqualify me for using it apply, then I just take it off the table and I write the method the other way. All right, so method add gas. And you might recall we had said that the logic here was going to be different we were going to take the existing amount of gas that we had, which is stored in the parameter gas, and just add this new amount of gas to it. And then we were going to return the amount of gas that that results in. So this would now be gas equals gas plus amount of gas. And then I want to set amount of gas to a new value. And so this would now say amount of gas equals gas. Okay, so kind of odd looking code at first glance, but I think it, it makes sense when you think about it. We're just going to add more gas to the gas tank, and then we're going to use the amount of gas to carry back to the caller what that result is. Now, as a point of fact, this could have been written as a functional method. I could have had an importing parameter that was the amount of gas coming in, and then I could have returned the resulting amount of gas total. But we did this just to illustrate how we could use changing. And I think that that is now the end of all of the methods that we have defined so far. So let's do two things. Let's get rid of the split screen. Let's save this. I guess this is now three things. And now we're going to cross our fingers and do a syntax check. And magically enough, I'm kind of shocked. I didn't make any typing mistakes. There's no periods missing. Um, and I could have a logic error in here somewhere. But at least syntactically, I'm good so far. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Let's look. So in my method definition, ah, now 
This right here, let's, let's look at this. If I were to say type P, and I think we were doing before length, length four decimals one, and you might have just picked up on the fact that that red tells me that clearly something is wrong, and let's see what my syntax check error tells me about this. Unable to interpret four, which is not a very helpful method or helpful error response. When I am specifying parameter passing for incomplete data types, I do not specify length and decimals because this is going to be created in the caller. The caller will have defined a pack number. And so I just have to be prepared to take in a pack number. And so it will work with that just fine. Now, in none of these are we doing pass by value. Everything here is pass by reference. We could add pass by value if we were so inclined, but we don't really need it for anything so far. And it also strikes me that we don't really have a complete piece of functionality because there's one thing in particular that's definitely missing in order for this class definition to make any sense at all. Can anybody guess what I'm talking about? What do you typically see in object-oriented programming and class definitions that we are severely lacking at this point? Now I'll give you a hint. It's a kind of method. Uh, that would be useful. We don't have any way of creating output here. We don't use necessarily two string in ABOP, but the same concept would definitely be true. Um, so that's a good answer. But what else are we missing? A constructor. Yeah, at this point, you would assume that when we create one of these objects, we'd want to set the name, the age, the gender, the years driving, the gas, and so on. I don't have a constructor method so far. So one of the things that we are going to have to talk about is, is how to create a, a constructor method. And so let's see what our next slide brings to us. It is not at this point a definition of how to create a constructor method, but one other fact here, which is sometimes in a method it becomes confusing as to whether or not we are referring to a parameter or an attribute. And let me give you an example of this by rewriting some of our code. And there's nothing wrong with our code the way we have written it, but suppose if we look at the set wheels method, and instead of calling the parameter new num wheels, we just called it wheels. Okay, so now I have a parameter named wheels and I have an attribute of the class named wheels. So, so far um, I'm okay. But then when I get down here to set wheels, I wind up with code that looks like this. Wheels equals wheels. So how does the computer know which of those is a reference to the attribute and which of those is the reference to the parameter. Well, different languages give us a way of disambiguating this. And the way we do this in attribute in, in ABOP is we use me and what looks like an arrowhead, and we use that to distinguish the attribute. So if I go back to the code we just changed, the attribute is what I'm looking to set. So this would be me, wheels equals wheels. This, exactly, exactly the same. Now, I, I have students every semester that say, me sounds stupid, why isn't it my? And I have no idea, it just is, okay? You know, um, but I agree with you, me wheels sounds like someone who's not fully literate. Uh, whereas my wheels would make a lot more sense. But, but, you know, take that up with the Germans who wrote this language. And so what this does is this allows us to disambiguate. And, and the fact is, 
it's not always necessarily going to be on the left hand side of the equal sign sometimes you have the attribute on the right hand side of the equal sign or in a calculation but you could and you wouldn't want to do this but anytime you're making a reference to the attributes or anytime you're making a reference to one of the attributes of the class you could drop a me arrowhead in front of it but we only need to do that when our code would be ambiguous see this right here driver dash name equals name I could put me driver dash name equals name but because the name of the variable here is actually driver this is not ambiguous because one of them is the name of the field and one of them is the name of the parameter okay so this is how we disambiguate name potential name collision and the ABOP language yes Let's see. It's a very good question. The field wheels cannot be modified. Okay, so see what it did? It assumed that I was making reference to the parameter. And the parameter wheels was set as an importing parameter. And so this is saying, hey, you're trying to change an importing parameter. So as a point of fact, if wheels in this case were changing or exporting, then it might have given me a subtly different error. But as soon as I drop that on there, and I don't think we demonstrated this, but if I do a syntax check now, then, then life is good. Okay, great question. All right, I'm actually going to, well, let's look at, I realize we haven't talked about creating a constructor method yet. That's because there's a couple other things we need to talk about, I think, before we start talking about making the constructor. How do we actually create an object? To this point now, we have a fully functioning class definition. It's fully formed. Now, there may be some parameters missing, or excuse me, there may be some, some attributes missing, there may be some methods we decide to add, but what we have is fully correctly defined. So maybe I wanna make one of these vehicles. Well, how do I do that? Objects are created by defining an object reference variable and then creating the object. So it's a two-step process. And the next thing to know about this is this is now our first time where we are introducing event-related control flow. We'll come back to events a little bit later. But what event-related control flow allows us to do is designate which portions of our code fire when, when the program is written. And so I have to designate the beginning of where flow of control is in this particular program. And I do that after all of my class definitions are over with. I'll just give myself a few blank lines here. And then I will write the code, start of selection. So essentially what's going to happen is when this program runs, it's gonna to jump to line 96 and start running from there. Because if you think about it, all of this stuff here at the top is almost like a type definition, but it's a type definition for a class. So it doesn't really need to do anything with that until we actually say we wanna make one of these vehicles. So I drop in a start of selection statement, and then I have two different lines. I have to create an object, data object. So keyword data, and then the name for my object, and then type ref2, and then the name of my class. Now, in ABOP, we call this a reference variable. In another programming language, we might call this a pointer because that's really what this is. So I'm actually doing two different things. I'm creating object name and saying, hey, this is a reference to an object, but I haven't actually created the object nest yet. I have to then follow that up with another line of code 
that says create object and then lists the name of the data object we created on the line previous. So go back to the code here and I could do this data my sports car type ref2 vehicle. So I'm, I just said, okay, I'm getting ready to create an object called my sports car, and I want it to be of this type vehicle that we have a definition of at the top of my program. But I haven't actually created it yet. Now I have to create object my sports car. So I have now created one of these guys or gals, as the case may be. Questions? Class vehicle definition, right there. That's, that's, the, that's the correspondence there. Okay, good question. Other questions? All right, so how do I call methods? Now, I don't have any method up here that has no parameter passing associated with it at all. Let's see if we could come up with something that, that would make sense. And we don't really have um, anything that occurs to me right off. So, so while I think about that, let's just start looking at this next slide. How do I call a method? I call a method by listing the name of the object, and then I use that arrowhead, like we saw a method ago, a, me a moment ago, and then I list the name of the method, and then open and closing parenthesis. Now notice, we've seen this before in certain contexts, there cannot be a space before the opening parentheses, but there has to be one after. So you see, that may look odd to you, the fact that you have opening and closing parentheses with a single space between them and no space before, but that's the way it has to be in ABOP. Now, this would be a way right here to call a method that had no parameter passing in it whatsoever. So let me just show you this, and I'm going to write really a pretty dumb method, okay? But just to show you this, I'm going to introduce a method here, uh, methods say hi, okay? And there's no parameter passing with it whatsoever. So then I'm going to go down here and I'm going to do, um, oh, that's interesting. I don't know if I remembered that we had that down there as a private attribute. We'll have to see if that comes into play anywhere else. So I'm going to go down here now into my implementation and I'm going to introduce a method or a method definition method and I think I call this what say hi and this method is just going to write out to the screen hi okay and and end method okay so not a um, super useful method all right uh, I probably should um, you know do, and I always get the slash going the wrong direction. Let's see if I've got this right this time. Okay, so, so now I want to call this say hi method. So I could come down here and I do the name of my object is my sports car, my sports car, arrowhead, and the name of my method was say hi. So now let's actually see if my program does anything and my object does in fact say hi, okay? So if I have no parameter passing, this is the way I call this. Things are gonna start getting weird here in a second. But the next one I think you'll see looks similar to what you've seen before. If I have only one importing parameter in the method definition, so if I have only one importing parameter, then I can just list the actual parameter in the parentheses by listing the name of the data object name only. So in other words, I can do this. Object method, and then in parentheses with a space before and a space after it, 
the value that I want to pass to that importing parameter, which could be a literal number, or as we're seeing here, this could be a variable. So let's go hunting in our code here to see if we have a method that has a single importing parameter. And we actually have two of them. We have set color and we have set wheels, okay? So I could do this, and this is great. This gives us a couple different ways to do this. I could do my sports car set wheels and I could hard code in a four there, okay? Now we could have a discussion here as to whether or not that should be a constant and whether or not magic numbers are good to use or not, but we will clearly see that this is syntactically valid, okay? Or I could do something like this, just to show you this, I could do data, um, new color equals, or data new color type string, and I'll go ahead and do this in one statement, value um, purple. So I could now do my sports car set color, new color. Okay. And neither of those results in any kind of output. So even if I ran this at this point, we'd still just see the word high. Questions about this so far? Okay, now is where things start getting a little bit different. Suppose I have more than one importing parameter. Well, here's the problem. Remember how some parameters are optional? So let's assume, let, let's look at one of our methods that has some things associated with it that are optional. So I'm going to go look at my interface here, and you'll notice with set driver, okay, technically the only thing I have to pass it is the year's driving. I could give the driver's name. I could give it an age, I could give it a gender. So how, when I call this, do I tell it which values I'm supplying and which values I'm not? In other words, if I passed it as parameters, Bob Smith M17, okay? Well, you might say, okay, well, Bob Smith is clearly the name. M, well, that doesn't make sense for age because age is an integer, so maybe M supposed to be the gender, but immediately you can see we've got some confusion here. And suppose I passed it Bob Smith and 17. Now it's going to be like, well, is 17 the age? Is 17 the years driving? How do I know which is which? And so we have to disambiguate this in our method call. So what we do is we do this, name of the object, arrowhead method, and then we treat this just like other code that we would write. So let, let me explain this. If I go back to this right here, this set driver method is expecting a name, an age, a gender, and a years. So I would just do this. I would have the first part of the code, and then in the parentheses, I would say name equals, and I'd put the name. And then I'd put age equals, and I'd put the age. And then I'd put gender equals, and I'd put ears driving equals. But what's on the left side of the equal sign is always these parameters right here. So let's write that code. My sports car set driver, and I've got to remember what was up there, name equals Robert, um, I think age was the next one, age equals 22, um, gender equals M, and then was a year's driving? Years driving equals, I was going to put 17, but that probably doesn't make sense. I'll do five. Okay. Now, what I have often thought 
is that you know when you're first learning how to program, a lot of people have a lot of confusion about parameter passing. It takes new students a long time to get used to that. I actually think this is really, really good because it makes it, let me move this more to the top of the screen so we can easily see. It makes it very clear what's going on here. I'm going to call this method and I'm going to set name to Robert. I'm going to set, I'm going to set the parameters to the values that you see here. So it's just the parameter on the left side of the equal sign. Now in this case, everything here on the right side of the equal sign, I've, I've hard coded in. But I trust you understand that the right side of the equal sign could be a variable. Well, remember, let's do this just to check ourselves. Let's do a syntax check here. And uh, my sports is a, no, thank you, my sports car. And we're good now. Was there a question or was somebody going to point that out? Okay. All right. So now remember, everything, we have a lot of stuff here that's, that's optional. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to copy line 113, and then I'm going to comment it out so that I still have it. And I'm going to, you know, we're going to observe that the set driver method, the only thing that's actually required is years driving. So I could wipe out, let's just say, name and age. Don't have to give either one of those. So we'll see that, in fact, um, this is perfectly valid code as well. So that's how we handle optional parameters. Optional parameters or ones that have a default value. So now, when my code runs, the name is going to be set to that default value I specified for name because there's not one coded in here. So this is how ABOP knows which parameters to set to what values. Now I will say you want to get in the habit of keeping the order, the same order that it's listed in, in the signature, understanding that you would just skip over the things that you want to skip over. Questions? Mm -hmm. I will tell you, and I think this is still a work underway, that SAP is working on a new programming environment that actually runs in a web browser as opposed to in the SAP GUI. For a while there, and your book even talks about this, there was a, a development environment for Eclipse. That has been uh, SAP's moving away from that for whatever reason. But the web-based browser that I've seen demos of has some really, really nice features to it. So I think you'll see things like that show up in that, but not in this at this point. It'd be really nice to have. Yes, sir. Let's check, because I don't know. I've just gotten into that habit to the point that I've not ever tested it. So let's see here. If I, I, All I did was change the order in which age is listed here. And um, it, it took that. So I think it just falls into the category of good habit. But let me also say, note that everything we've been talking about to this point has been importing parameters. We talked about calling a method that only has well, we talked about calling a method that has no parameters. That's this guy up here on line 107. We talked about calling a method that has one importing parameters, and that's what we saw here on line 111. And now we've talked about calling a method that has multiple importing parameters, which is what we're seeing on line 113. You'll notice we haven't done anything yet with changing or exporting, and we haven't done anything with, with returning. So, well, actually we did do something with returning, but we haven't seen it on this side of it. If there are parameters of types other than importing, the type of the parameter passing 
must be listed. So my call is now going to look like this. Exporting parameter name, value name. Importing however many of those I have, parameter name, value name. Changing parameter name, value name. And probably none of you picked up on something that's very, very subtle here. Remember when I told you on a slide, and let's go back and look at it a few slides ago, about the order in which these guys had to show up. And remember, when we write the method definition, we list them in the order importing, then exporting, then changing, then returning. And then notice this right here, exporting and importing, and then changing. Here's where it gets weird, and I actually have a slide, I think, out of order here. So I'm going to jump over to slide 16. Parameter passing types defined in the method definition correspond with the parameter passing types in the caller, but are not the same. Okay, so here's the idea. Imagine, imagine two countries and a ship passing between those two countries. So here's, here's the USA and, and here's China, okay? And there's a ship that's going to move between our two countries, okay? From the US's perspective, we might import goods from China. Well, on the China side, that means they're exporting goods to us. You get that? You know, that would mean the boat's traveling this direction. And if the boat were traveling the other direction, then in the US, we would say we're exporting stuff to China. And from China's perspective, they're importing stuff. That's the way this works with our methods, OK? If in the method definition, we say we're importing data, then in the call to the method, we list that parameter passing type as exporting. It's kind of like throwing versus catching. If importing means I'm catching it, then exporting means the method call is throwing it to me. And then we flip that around. If the method says I'm exporting stuff, which means I'm throwing it back, then the method call lists that as importing. Now, changing is really nice and easy because changing is changing. And then we get this weird thing, though, where returning is receiving. And let's just ignore that one for right now. So the idea here is what I've illustrated at the bottom. From the method calls perspective, I'm exporting data to you. And then from the method's definition perspective, I'm importing data from you. So it's kind of a throwing versus catching, importing, exporting terminology here. So to go back to slide 14, what this right here is saying, that if I looked at the definition of whatever this method is that's at the very bottom of the screen, it has two importing parameters, P1 and P2. And it has two, or it has one exporting parameter, PAR3. And it has one changing parameter, PAR4. So in my call, I explicitly have to describe this with the appropriate parameter passing mechanism in place. Now, the question becomes, do we have anything this complicated in our example code here. OK, we have importing, we have importing, we have Im ex or importing. There we go. We have exporting get driver info. OK, so now we have a need for this. So notice, let's do the split screen thing again. There's get driver info. Get driver info is going to give me back a string, it's going to give me back an age, it's going to give me back a gender, and it's going to give me back a year's driving. So I'll come down here and I'll do my sports car get driver info. And I say to myself, okay, that says exporting, so down here I'm, I'm importing. And I've got to put a space 
always after that parenthesis. And, and I need some variables. You know, I don't have any variables here. So I'm going to have a data statement, driver, name, type, string. Um, I should make you should. And data, um, age, type, I. And data, gender, type, C, length, 1. And, and just notice for the sake of illustration here, I, I'm not going to actually create a variable to, to catch years driving. So I now say I'm going to be importing, and I still list the parameters the same way. Name is going to be set equal to driver name. And age is going to be set equal to age. I don't need disambiguation here because it knows that the left-hand side is the name of this up here, and the right-hand side is a value that I'm passing to it from my program. And then gender equals gender. Just for the sake of clarity, so that this doesn't confuse you, I'll do this. I'll do driver age, and I'll do driver gender, and this will be driver age. Oh no, this will be age equals driver age. I'm going to go to a new line here. Um, gender equals driver gender. Okay, and let me do a syntax check here, and then we'll talk about a couple of really, really important things here. All right, so I want to just reiterate where it's easy to make a mistake. What is always on the left side of the equal sign is the name of the parameters from the method definition. That's always on the left side of the equal sign. It's really easy to get that flipped. On the right side of the equal sign, you'll notice here on line 113, those were values I was passing to the method for it to use. But get driver info is sending data back to me. So everything here on the right side of the equal sign has to be a variable because I'm going to catch the values in this. Now let's notice a couple of other things here. That method has name, age, gender, years driving. I don't see where I put years driving in my call to that method. Is that a problem? Why is it not a problem? Okay, that's a good answer, but why else is it not a problem? What did we observe previously about exporting parameters? They're always optional by default. Okay, So I could actually call get driver info and only use that to get the driver's name back if that's all I cared about. Okay, So just to prove that this works, because we can get back the driver's name, um, and his age and his gender because we set that on line 113. So I'm going to do a write statement here and I'm just going to write out um, driver name and then um, driver age and then driver gender. And we should see Robert, 22, male. Robert, 22, and male. As an, obs as an aside, just to show this works, remember up here where we said that name was optional and we actually had a default value specified? Let's see what happens when we get rid of that there. Now we're going to see as a result here, hi, name unknown. So the name was set to the default value, which was name unknown. And obviously, I haven't made any effort at all here to make this pretty, but we do, in fact, see that we got back the expected values from our definition. So if you think about it, this is actually pretty nice because what I could do is I could have a method like get driver info that I could define that lists every one of my attributes of my class. You know, I could have a class that had 30 attributes, 
and I could write one method that would allow the caller to retrieve whichever of those 30 it wanted with one method. And all you would have to do is call it and use the importing statement and list the ones that you want the values returned for. So this gives us actually what is commonly called polymorphism because we can have one method that could be called a huge number of different ways and yet it, it, it works without me needing to define. You think about some programming languages like Java. You might have to define a whole bunch of different methods if you wanted one that would let the user just get back the name, age, and gender, and you wanted another one that would let you get back their name, age, gender, and years driving. No way you could do that with one method that could be called either way. ABAP makes it very easy for us to do things like that, as you see illustrated here. Questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah. Parameters in this context could go a couple of different places. And let's, let's take driver name as an example here. Let, let's make this a parameter statement instead. Okay, so I could come up here And I believe I can drop it right there. Oh, now I have the issue of it being too long here. Uh, driver N. And now I'm going to have to come down here and change this uh, down here. Driver N. And driver N. Oh, hang on. That's where I should be doing this. I pick the one of these that's the most complicated. Because I don't know if it'll actually let me change it. But but let's go back up to my where's my set? Oh, I took the setting the driver's name out of here, didn't I? Set driver and this should be uh name equals driver n. Let me do a syntax check on that because I just changed a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, that works. All right, so now Roberto, okay, and Roberto, okay. So, so I could put it there. You could put it. I, I think we probably could get away with putting it at the very top, but I, I wouldn't suggest to do that. I think it should go right after start of selection, okay. And and what we ultimately will move to is the idea that everything that we have at the top of our program now could well reference something that's actually in the ABOP dictionary as opposed to local to our program. Okay? Other questions? All right, well, this looks like a good place for us to stop for today. Um, look this over because although I'm not making any specific promises, uh, we haven't had a quiz in a while, and Tuesday could be a good day for a quiz. So make sure you come prepared for that possibility. Since you don't have a, a homework program over the weekend, you should have time to study for that. If you did not sign in, please make sure you come up here to the front and do that. And I'll look forward to seeing you guys when we get together next week.